Good afternoon, and thank everyone for their uh, accommodating our uh, voting schedules, and we apologize for any uh, inconvenience. This is a hearing on FDA medical device approval. Is there a better way? Uh, first, I'm going to read the mission statement for the uh, Oversight Committee. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent, and second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Um, at this point, I will uh, give an opening statement, and then I will uh, recognize uh, my distinguished colleague uh, for his. I want to start by acknowledging what, what uh, everyone knows, which is the FDA performs a necessary and vital function in our country. Doctors, patients, nurses, health care professionals, and businesses rely, businesses rely on their work uh, every day, whether it is a doctor utilizing a medical device to save the life of a patient or a business introducing the latest innovation to the market. From bandages and pacemakers, uh, the, the American people deserve and the Federal Government demands safe and effective medical products across the health care industry. Uh, there is a balance, an important balance to be struck. A paramount concern is always the well-being of the American citizens in need of medical care. In an industry with such wide-ranging economic implications, however, efficiency and safety need not be mutually exclusive. The FDA's goals as an agency are to make safe and effective devices available to consumers and to promote innovation in the medical device industry. Distilled down to a simple mission statement, this philosophy represents a proper and attainable goal. However, the FDA is perhaps failing to meet these standards for myriad reasons, inconsistent review procedures, unpredictability of decision making, and an amorphous process that fosters uncertainty and inefficiency. And perhaps most troubling, instead of identifying the issues and implementing reforms designed to ameliorate the substantive shortcomings of the approval process, the conveyor belt of medical device approvals has come, in some instances, to a grinding halt. In the pre-medical application and 510K approval processes, device approval times have increased 50 to 100 percent. Decision times, preliminary procedure durations, and the number of FDA requested question cycles are all on the rise at the cost of patients and businesses who suffer from these delays. As a result, medical device businesses are exporting products to international consumers long before American buyers or they are leaving the United States altogether, harming both the United States economy and patients who rely on life-saving new technologies. This lack of predictability hurts American businesses, consumers, and patients. We are here today to determine what can be done on their behalf and to ask simply whether or not there is a better way. And with that, I would recognize the distinguished gentleman from the State of Illinois, the uh, ranking member of this subcommittee, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me first of all thank you for calling this very important hearing. And I also want to thank you for yielding. Uh, I call it important because the Food and Drug Administration is an agency that I have watched closely for a number of years. As a matter of fact, one of my constituents, Dr. Alexander Max Smith, was the director of this agency and he also was the dean of the medical school at the University of Illinois. And so we have looked at it for a long time. The Food and Drug Administration is responsible for ensuring the safety and effectiveness of medical devices that millions of Americans use to help them walk, to help their hearts beat, and to help their children regain their health and live a normal and productive life. The regulations that govern the approval of medical devices are there for a critical and simple reason. They save American lives and prevent injury by medical devices that are unsafe or ineffective. We all understand the importance of protecting jobs and fostering innovation. Illinois is home to hundreds of large and small medical device manufacturers 
employing thousands of my constituents in many of these facilities I have visited. I applaud the technological advances being made each day, some of which have allowed close friends and family to lead productive lives. Nevertheless, I fully understand the importance of striking the right balance between innovation and safety. There are those who believe that the Food and Drug Administration takes too long to review medical devices. For its part, the FDA has offered statistics that the agency says shows it is performing well in this regard. We will hear today from both the FDA and those involved in the medical device industry. As we listen to the testimony today and consider the views of the witnesses, we cannot lose sight of, of what is ultimately at stake, the lives of average Americans who rely on the FDA to protect them from faulty medical devices that may cause harm. It is the FDA who bears the awesome responsibility of protecting lives by ensuring that medical devices do what the manufacturers claim they do. There are those who have suggested that the FDA's approval process for medical devices should be more like the approval process in the European Union. That is troubling to me because in the European Union, medical device manufacturers do not have to show that their product is actually effective in treating the particular ailment it is supposed to treat. I am sure there isn't anyone in this room who would want a hip implant, a heart stent, or any other device in their body that was not effective. In the past five months, at least 15 recalls of medical devices were announced. These recalls involve such products as glucose test strips, catheters, an insulin delivery system, and an implantable infusion pump. Last year, there were over 2,500 recalls of medical devices. One of the most widely covered devices recalled last year involved hip implants that had already been used in 93,000 patients before they were recalled by the company. There is no greater responsibility that our government has than to protect the health and lives of its citizens. That is a responsibility that Congress has bestowed on the FDA. And so I thank our witnesses for being here today, look forward to their testimony. And again, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for calling this hearing, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, members may have seven days to submit opening statements and extraneous material for the, re uh, for the record. Uh, it is all of our pleasure, uh, all members of the subcommittee, to welcome uh, our colleague from the great state of Minnesota, Congressman uh, Eric Paulson, who represents the 3rd District. In addition to serving on Ways and Means, Mr. Paulson chairs the Congressional Medical Device Caucus. Uh, Congressman Paulson, uh, committee welcomes you and recognizes you for uh, five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for the opportunity to be, be, appear before the committee. My name is Eric Paulson. As you mentioned, I represent Minnesota's 3rd Congressional District, and I do serve as co-chair of the Medical Technology Caucus. And I would like to share with you why I believe the medical technology industry, an American success story, one that routinely revolutionizes patient care and creates thousands of high-tech jobs, is at risk of drying up and moving overseas. Now, I can tell you that promoting Made in America medical devices and encouraging innovation is near and dear to my heart. Across this country, there are 8,000 medical device firms employing 400,000 dedicated, hardworking, and innovative people. Currently, the United States is a world leader in this industry. Its supremacy is threatened not by cheap overseas labor or countries with more competitive tax structures, but by the bureaucracy within our own borders. Whether I am meeting with medical innovators back home in Minnesota or across the country, I hear the same story. It is getting harder and harder to bring life-saving devices to the marketplace in the United States because of a lack of consistency, predictability, and transparency in the Food and Drug Administration's pre-market review processes. Device companies that, regularly, uh, that deal regularly with the FDA cite many reasons for this inconsistency. One problem is that the FDA seems to be routinely proposing new endpoints midway through the review process. 
Now, of course, if scientific information calls a device into question, the FDA should request more information. But many of my constituency companies are reporting that the FDA reviewers make new, arbitrary demands late in the product review process. And these inconsistencies are frustrating and costly for all innovators, but small companies in particular cannot keep up when the FDA continually moves the goalpost, which is causing some firms to go out of business. One company in Minnesota, Acorn Cardiovascular, recently had to close its doors due to such inconsistencies. The company had conversation after conversation with FDA staff about how to test its device. Acorn performed a randomized trial, met its targets, and in the end thought it would be approved, but reviewers at the FDA moved the goalposts and required a new trial. Because of this, investors shied away, and Acorn couldn't raise the capital to perform another multi-million dollar trial and had to close its doors. Ultimately, 50 jobs were lost and a life-saving technology for patients is now not available in the United States. Additionally, companies have been frustrated with what appear to be FDA stalling techniques. Many entrepreneurs I have met with have had agency reviewers pursue one line of questioning early in the review process and then switch to a new, previously unaddressed topic after the third or fourth submission. In 2008, Extent, a Menlo Park, California company, Coronary Stent Company, tried to gain approval to start a U.S. clinical trial. Over the next two years, the FDA asked round after round of questions and required long preclinical animal trials. Now, at the time, Extent had clinical experience in hundreds of European patients, some with over three years of follow-up in world-class hospitals. But the FDA refused to consider the data, and as a result of the delays, the company closed, 150 employees were laid off, and the assets were sold to foreign interests for pennies on the dollar. Members, today the technology is now being developed in China and in Europe with no plans to return to the United States. Now, this is just one of many examples, and if it pleases the committee, I would like to submit several more uh, for the record. And thanks in part to the inconsistencies like these, we're starting to see our competitive edge disappear. Currently, devices are approved two years earlier in Europe than they are in the United States, which deny our patients access to life-saving technology. If this trend continues, more companies will look for greener pastures and take their innovations and their 400,000 high-paying jobs with them. The FDA has a statutory mandate to consider the least burdensome means of demonstrating devices that they meet safety and efficacy standards. And unfortunately, in recent years, the agency has abandoned this principle. The least burdensome provisions should force the agency to find appropriate balance between patient protection and the development of new life-saving products. I'm working on legislation to restore this balance at the agency and other efforts to modernize and streamline the FDA. It is my hope as well, Mr. Chairman, that today's hearing will help us find that balance and a pathway to a more consistent, predictable, and transparent FDA pre-market review process to help the medical technology industry continue to be a bright spot of our economy and ensure patient access to life-saving medical technologies. Thank you again for the opportunity to appear before the committee today, Mr. Chairman. On behalf of all of us, Congressman Paulson, thank you for your testimony. Thank you for your insight. Thank you for your work in this uh, area. And I look forward to uh, reviewing your uh, legislation forthwith. Thank you. We will take a uh, quick, quick recess. In fact, I may not even leave so the second panel can approach and get uh, situated. Um, and when they are situated, we will uh, start again. Until then, we will be briefly recessed.
swear my what you said. We will uh, now welcome our second uh, panel of, uh, I won't say witnesses, witness, singular. Uh, Dr. Jeffrey uh, Shuren, have I pronounced that correctly? Uh, Dr. Shuren is the Director of the Centers for Devices and Radiological Health at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Uh, pursuant to committee rules, uh, all witnesses will be sworn in before they testify, so I would ask you to rise and lift your right hand and repeat after me, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect the witness answered in the affirmative. Thank you. Um, Dr. Shuren, we will recognize you at this point for your five-minute uh, opening statement. I'm sure you have done this before. If you have not, there are a series of lights that may help uh, direct you. But um, if, you, uh, if you have a, a point that you want to finish, even with the red light, feel free to finish your point. I may get you to turn that mic on. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I'm Dr. Jeff Shuren, Director, Center for Devices and Radiological Health at the Food and Drug Administration. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Over the past decade, most indicators of medical device industry success have gone steadily upwards with solid job growth, venture capital investment, and a positive trade balance. Although the medical device industry has weathered the recession better than most of our industries, including about 6 percent growth last year, the economic climate has had an adverse impact. And as recent reports note, the recession has also caused companies to change their business models to be more risk averse and therefore more sensitive to FDA regulatory uncertainties. We recognize that smart FDA regulation is critical to maintain U.S. competitiveness. We are the world's leader in medical device innovation. But we won't retain that position unless we address the challenges that face us today and assure that we have both a strong industry and a strong FDA. According to a recent PWC report, formerly PricewaterhouseCoopers, and I quote, U.S. success in medical technology during recent decades stems partially from the global leadership of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. FDA's standards and guidelines to ensure safety and efficacy have instilled confidence in the industry's products worldwide. FDA has a responsibility to both facilitate device innovation and assure that devices are safe and effective. Our data reported to Congress in February shows that about 95 percent of the more than 4,000 medical device applications subject to user fees that we review each year are reviewed within the timeframes that were agreed to by industry under the Medical Device User Fee Act. In those few areas where we just missed some goals, our performance is generally improving. The data also demonstrates a program under strain with limited capacity to increase performance at current funding levels. However, when I became the director of the Medical Device Center in fall 2009, I had already been hearing concerns expressed by our constituencies. Industry complained that inadequate predictability, consistency and transparency were stifling innovation. Consumer groups, third-party payers, and some healthcare professionals believe that our largest pre-market review process, called the 510K program, did not provide adequate patient protections or generate sufficient information for them to make well-informed treatment decisions. Even my own staff complained about regulatory programs that in their current form were not well suited for many newer, more complex technologies. Much like a CEO of a big company with a large and diverse clientele, I and my team set about to identify problems in their root causes, starting with a comprehensive assessment of our pre-market review programs. The two reports we released in August 2010 with our analyses and recommendations showed that we have not done as good a job managing our pre-market review programs as we should and that we needed to take several critical actions to improve the predictability, consistency and transparency of these programs. For example, we have new reviewers who need better training. We need to improve management oversight and standard operating procedures. We need to provide greater clarity for our staff and for industry through guidance about key parts of our pre-market review and clinical trials programs and how we make benefit risk determinations. We need to provide greater clarity uh, for industry through guidance and greater interactions about what we need from them to facilitate more efficient, predictable reviews. 
We need to make greater use of outside experts who understand cutting-edge technologies. And we need to find the means to handle the ever-increasing workload and reduce staff and manager turnover, which is almost double that of FDA's drug and biologic centers. In addition, we need to assure that industry meets its responsibility to provide us with appropriate data. Poor quality submissions, such as those that do not follow current guidance documents or have problems with clinical data, such as missing data, not doing the study we agreed to, or failing to meet endpoints, are significant contributors to delays in pre-market reviews. In January this year, after extensive public input, we announced 25 specific actions we are taking this year to ensure that our pre-market review programs both foster innovation and assure the safety and efficacy of medical devices for American patients. In February, we proposed the Innovation Initiative to accelerate the development and evaluation of important medical devices and improve and strengthen the nation's research infrastructure, promote high-quality regulatory science for all medical devices. In March, we held a public meeting to discuss these proposals, and in the coming weeks, we will announce what actions we plan to take. Mr. Chairman, I commend the subcommittee's efforts and am pleased to answer any questions the subcommittee may have. Thank you, Dr. Schur. And at this uh, point, I would uh, recognize the uh, ranking member of the subcommittee, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, for his five minutes of questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Schur. Congressman uh, Paulson just testified, and you were here during that period, and um, indicated that we might want to look at the way the European Union handles its process. And yet I was thinking that a Price Waterhouse study determined that the United States medical device industry is the best in the world. Um, how do you respond to, to those two assertions? Well, I do have concerns about importing the European model here to the U.S. And I'm actually astonished that some in the device industry are calling for us to lower our standards to that of Europe. Um, I don't think it's in the best interest of American patients, our health care system, or the U.S. companies. In Europe, you do not need to show that your device is effective, that in fact provides benefits to patients. For example, uh, you will put, let's say, a drug-eluting stent on the market. Um, that device may not work, and so patients can get a device that's ineffective when they had alternative effective treatments. As a result, they put their health at risk, and the health care system winds up paying for it. In addition, in Europe, you have a Pay, you have pick and pay for your private party reviewer. Reviews are conducted by third parties called notified bodies. Uh, but concerns have been raised about them. In fact, the clinical director of the UK regulatory agency said just last year, I am appalled at how many devices are brought to market with a lack of appropriate clinical data. Nor are notified bodies doing enough to pick up manufacturers' shortcomings. She pointed out that many do not know how to adequately assess or challenge clinical data or tell these companies relying on equivalents that they actually need to do clinical investigations. In fact, these are commercial organizations, and I quote, many of whom are reluctant to challenge because they are fear losing their clients and for their survival. And many of these concerns were pointed out recently in articles that came out in the British Medical Journal and by the European Society of Cardiology. Do you think that there is any evidence that the longer and more intense process has any negative impact on the development of jobs and, and work opportunities? Well, I do think that there is, we can do a far better job than what we are already doing. And there are steps that we have announced and are already taking that we think can actually make the process more efficient. Um, and try to get innovative technologies out to the market in a more timely manner, but not compromise our standard of safety and effectiveness. We do have a great standard that we need to stand behind. And if we had to take a play out of the playbook of the European Union, the European Commission is now getting behind their approval process. They call the CE mark. Here in the U.S., we beat ourselves up, and the Europeans are taking advantage of it. But we need to get behind a system that, quite frankly, has good standards. We need to make it more robust and efficient. And if we can promote our system as the gold standard, we can actually promote greater competitiveness for the U.S. and for U.S. companies. 
I know that diabetes is a major health problem and issue in the country, and uh, research is being done. There is research relative to the creation of, of, of pancreas activity and how to better regulate that. Where, where do we stand now with this? Uh, so trying to promote the development of an artificial pancreas is a high priority for the agency. I'm a physician. If we can really crack the nut and have truly a replacement, if you will, for the pancreas for type 1 diabetes patients, it will be a huge advance in health care. We have already set up a special team who, by the way, is headed by someone who has type 1 diabetes, very invested in the technology. We have approved already 16 clinical trials. We have worked to help develop a sort of computer model that will allow the developers of these technologies to test drive their software algorithms without having to do animal studies, and so speed development. And in just a few weeks, we will be re releasing a guidance document that lays out expectations for bringing the early generation of an artificial pancreas low glucose suspend devices to market. Thank you very much. I am a big fan of research, and I think that we have made enormous gains. And so I wish you well with this one, and uh, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Davis. The Chair would now recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Walsh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Davis from Illinois. Dr. Shuren, thank you for uh, appearing before us today. A couple quick questions. And, and Congressman Paulson alluded to this in his testimony, and it is probably fairly common with what most of us here back home. Uh, the refrain is fairly similar. It is getting tougher and tougher, uh, many of these constituents and companies say, to deal with the FDA. Um, delays, issues of transparency, issues of confusion um, have become real uh, passionate concerns that have been voiced to many members of Congress. Um, do you, first quick broad question. Do you share do you hear similar concerns with, oh. with some, uh, some of the members in the industry? Uh, we do hear similar concerns. The second refrain that seems to be fairly common when I talk to my colleagues, because I hear this over and over back home, that it has become noticeably more difficult to work with and deal with the FDA in the last two to three years. Have you heard? any sort of similar uh, timeline concern as well? well I have heard concerns regarding interactions from some in industry. You know, interestingly enough, PwC did a survey, and they had reported, their respondents uh, reported that 39 percent that act felt that uh, interactions had actually gotten better between industry and the agency, and the rest of the people who responded were somewhat neutral. I, I, can, you, can you clarify, can you, can you sort of broadly generalize, though, what the feedback you have gotten in the last two to three years from so, the industry? And I can't say in the last two to three years since I have only been at the agency, uh, the agency, the center, for a little over a year and a half. So I kind of came in in the middle of all of this. Um, but the concerns in terms of interactions go along the following lines. Um, first of all, they would like more interactions with us, and we agree. Um, one of the challenges we have is that our request for meetings before doing a clinical trial or submitting an application, we call them pre-submission meetings, has almost doubled in the past five years, uh, but without the staff to actually make good on those commitments to have the meetings. We have heard, too, that there is a greater desire that when they get advice at a meeting, will the agency stand behind it? Um, and in addition, um, that they have opportunities for more engagement with the center during the time of a review of an application. One of the big points we have heard is, is that, uh, from folks in the FDA, is that one of the reasons for the delays in product approval of the last two to three years is the poor quality submissions that device manufacturers are sending to the FDA. Um, poor quality, incomplete submissions. Are, are, are those contributing issues to the delay in product approval? 
They are a contributing factor. We did an analysis of the letters we send to companies for 510K submissions. We call them additional information letters. And we looked at about 100 of them for 2010. And what we found is that for a little over 50 percent of the 510Ks we were receiving, uh, we did have issues with poor quality. This would be that we put out a guidance document, a current guidance document, explain what our expectations were, and the company didn't follow it and also didn't justify why they didn't comply with the guidance, because they have flexibility, but they would have to then provide an alternative method. Or there was testing that they would conduct that was the same kind of testing you do for that kind of device. In some cases, a company even made that kind of device before, did that kind of testing, and now didn't do it, didn't submit it to us, no testing whatsoever. That's the kind of poor quality that we have seen. And it is a contributing factor, but it's not the only factor. Okay. Again, according to the FDA's own data, A1 requests rose from, I think, 38 percent in 2001 to 77 percent in 2010. Total review times have risen 45 percent since 2007. And maybe you are saying this, it just doesn't seem plausible, plausible that those declines in FDA performance can all be put at the laps of the manufacturers. How much of the, um, of the, the problem is with the FDA itself? In this, in this sort of declining performance, um, maybe in, in not being clear what it requires in a submission or that requirements are constantly changing? How much of a factor are those issues? So first, uh, just to clarify, our performance uh, against the goals that we committed to meet with industry um, had actually overall improved over time. And we are meeting the goals for 510K. Uh, we're meeting one or close to meeting another goal for PMA, and that even over this time of MEDUFA, we've seen improvement in our performance. However, um, there have been longer times overall from between our time and industry time, what we call total time. So the contributors, one, is where we get submissions that they don't have the information they really should have and they know they should have. Now, in some cases, though, um, we do ask for things that we hadn't asked for before that are appropriate. And there are cases where we can do a better job communicating that beforehand. So one of the actions we're taking is to put out what we call a notice to industry letter where we can quickly communicate if there is a change in expectations in the basis. I will tell you as well, to be frank, we had, and that occurs about less than 10 percent of the time where we ask for additional but we think appropriate. There are times, though, where we, when we went back on the analysis where we found that we asked for additional information or we asked a question we shouldn't have asked. It's about less than 10 percent of the 510Ks, but that is concerning to us. And so we have already been starting to put in place changes into the program to address that, because we'd like, we don't want to see that happen. Last quick question, Mr. Chairman. I know I'm running out of time. This is a pendulum. Uh, we, we want to make sure we've got quality products and we want to promote innovation. Do you see at all that the pendulum, pendulum the last few years has swung too far in one direction and it's stifling innovation? I wouldn't exactly say the pendulum is swinging far one way versus the other. I think we've got multifactorial issues. Are you concerned about innovation right now? I do. I am concerned about innovation. I'm also concerned that we assure that the devices come on the market are safe and effective. What we ultimately want is, call it a pendulum or anything else, that the goalposts, if you will, aren't moving all that much, that thank we have a far more predictable problem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank the gentleman from Illinois. Uh, the Chair would now recognize the uh, gentleman from Tennessee, Dr. Desjardins. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Dr. Schoen. Uh, you are you're a physician. When, when did you last practice medicine? Um, in the 90s. In the 90s. Okay. Uh, certainly, then you have experienced the, the rise in health care costs that continue to increase. Uh, yearly to a point where you know, we are almost unsustainable. We see Medicare, Medicaid, uh, private insurance uh, going through the roof to where you know, people just simply can't continue to go on. Uh, do you recall when that change really started taking place in terms of rising costs? What, what would be your opinion on that? Uh, that is outside my purview at the FDA. So. I don't have a, an official opinion on that. Okay. Well, I, I practiced for about 18 years, and, and through the 90s, the cost certainly increased, and, and there was an increase in 
uh, regulation in the practice of medicine. There certainly has been an increase in pharmaceuticals, uh, increase in, in devices, and, and uh, you know, the FDA oversees this. And most people, whether it's in the medical industry or any other number of businesses, feel that burdensome fe federal regulations are uh, causing increase in costs. So uh, we were talking earlier about Europe, and uh, on average medical devices are approved two, two full years later in the U.S. And uh, why did you say it takes so much longer for the FDA to approve these devices than the European firms? Uh, well, actually, if you look at the report um, from the California Healthcare Institute for 510K devices that don't have clinical data, and that's about 80 percent of the devices um, that we review, um, they come on the market in the U.S. first uh, as compared to Europe at least half the time or more frequently. Um, and, in fact, the performance there looks like it's getting better in 2009 and 2010. Now, when we deal with the high-risk devices, the PMA devices, these are a lot of the implantable, life-saving technologies, those devices have tended to come on the market in Europe before the U.S. for a very long period of time. Um, and as mentioned beforehand, uh, the standards there are very different. And with the global recession, Companies now are looking to go to the market where it's easiest to get onto. Companies that are looking to sell where before you could sell before you got approved, now are being expected to get approved somewhere, and then you can get bought up. So the enticement to go to any country that has a lower standard is going to be greater. The solution here isn't for us to lower our standards. It's to get our program more predictable and efficient so that we can get innovative technologies to, to market more quickly, but we can assure that they're safe and effective. Because if not, and as a physician, we put patients at risk. If we give to them a device, and I don't know anyone okay. here who wants a device. Okay, that they don't you. know. Are you familiar with the uh, Mac Hour survey? Yes. Okay, it would contradict uh, significantly what you're saying uh, right now in terms of devices. Are, is that a credible study? Um, no, I have concerns with the MacCar study. It's actually um, less than 10 percent of the industry actually responded to it. Even of the population they were looking at, is less than 20. Many of the questions had less than 10 percent. And if you compare the U.S. and to the EU, at most less than 8 percent of the people they sent the survey to um, actually could have had the same product come on the market in the EU and in Europe for some of the things where they try to make comparisons. So you're saying the United things. States is actually quicker to get devices through than European companies? So I think according, and I'm going well, by... it sounds like the way you're spinning it. So according to some of the reports from industry, some of these devices are actually coming on the market first in the U.S. as opposed to the EU. But for the high-risk devices, as a general matter, for many years, they come on the market first in Europe, then in the U.S. Okay. Now, the now, these delays can cost uh, these companies uh, 20 to $40 million. Do you know the corresponding cost, it, it, what, what the corresponding cost is to patients of having delayed access to medical devices? Um, the cost of a delayed access for an ineffective medical device, I would say, would be huge, but not in favor of the patient. Look, as a doctor, if we have good technologies that are safe and effective, we want to get them out. To patients. We also want to make sure they are safe and effective, because we don't do ourselves, we don't do patients, we don't do our health care system justice if we are getting out devices that are not effective. And in Europe, there have been a number of cases since the late 1990s where they approved a device, and then later they actually did the studies, and they found it was ineffective or unsafe. Okay. Well, I will in interrupt just for a second, because I understand that you are defending the uh, agency you work for. But as a, being a practicing physician at one time, and myself being a practicing physician, I know that there is a line there. Uh, that is being crossed for, on a Federal level and that we are driving up patient costs sometimes unnecessarily. And, and I know that a lot of patients feel the same way, again, whether it is pharmaceuticals or devices. And the United States is one of the most expensive places right now on health care, and we are going to have to do something about that. So, you know, the, the testimony that you are giving today sounds good from an FDA standpoint, but doesn't pass the practical test uh, for me as a physician and many of my colleagues. But I appreciate your statement. I thank the gentleman from Tennessee. The Chair would now recognize the gentleman from the great state of North Carolina, Mr. McHenry. Almost as great as the state of South Carolina, right, Mr. Chairman? Um, almost. Almost. Uh, uh, doctor, thank you for your testimony. Uh, I, we understand you know, you've been on the job now for how long? How many months? Uh, about 19. 19 months. Okay. And um, 
you know, it, we know that, uh, you, you know, you're taking on an active agency, and so uh, change often comes slow in, in government. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, we appreciate the position you're in. Um, now, you, you talked about the, uh, the EU standards versus our standards um, and getting a product to market in EU in the EU versus here. It's just it's a different process, right? Uh, that's correct. Uh, what is the safety record? Is there a difference in the safety record? So one of the challenges with the EU is they do not have publicly available centralized database for that kind of information as you have here in the U.S. But we are aware of a number of cases of devices that got approved in Europe that subsequently were found to be ineffective or unsafe. A number of them were withdrawn from the market. A number. Do you were have any studies you could point to? Studies, no, but we have the case. Okay, then, then you know. Well, I will say to, to my colleague here. Oh, uh, to my colleague here, you know, you had you had a problem with the statistical relevance of the Macauer, uh, Macauer uh, study. You're saying it was only 10 percent, and uh, you know, so you're saying that study is not statistically sound. Yeah, in terms of the numbers that you look at. Okay, then I would question your you're saying that uh, the EU has a lower safety standard or a worse safety standard than the U.S. if there's not relevant data? Well, they have a lower standard to market because they do not require that a device be shown effective. And okay. So in terms of the effectiveness of our regulation, because we're not arguing that, you, that, that we have a government agency allow unsafe products that are not going to be helpful onto the market. Likewise, I want to ensure that my constituents have the ac access to uh, the the life saving, whether it's devices or uh, healthcare, or medicine or procedures, possible. So there is a balance, and I think we're you know I think we all care about that, maintaining that. But the difference in in the Macauer uh, report from from Stanford, um, it, it took 31 months uh, from from first communication to be cleared to market here in the U.S. Like uh, for low and moderate risk devices, it took seven months in Europe. Um, can, can we reduce that gulf? What, what are you doing to reduce that 31 month uh, time so, length? So the comparison is apples to oranges. Um, when they went in the EU, first of all, it's 15, it looks like it's 15 companies they got to respond okay. to. Okay, actually, and let me ask you a question then. Let me ask you a question, because you don't like, uh, you, you don't really want to respond to the Stanford research. No, I do so want to respond let me, to it. Well, you just want to dismiss it. So let me ask you this question. What is the average time from first communication to clearing to market for a device? Uh, for first commu it depends what you mean on first communication. If it's from the application coming in the door, which is actually the comparison for Europe. So you're oftentimes for those devices not going to the notified body beforehand, and that's why it's apples and oranges. You come to us because you come to so the what FDA is that? if you're going to do a clinical study. Okay, so, so, so from first application to clearing to the market. Yeah, so if you're talking about um, for a 510K, the average now is, um, and I'll double check on the exact numbers, it's around 140 days there about. 140 days. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what is that in Europe? In Europe, in Europe, we don't know. There's no publicly available data regarding the reviews that occur in Europe, both time frames and the basis for the decisions. We have no idea what they even rely on when they make a decision in Europe. So you're saying the Europeans are just in a different world when it comes to safety and soundness of medical devices, and there's no way for us to know a com reasonable comparison. They don't make that data available. In fact, the lack of transparency was recently criticized. Okay. In the so let me ask you, are you happy with the length of time it takes from first communication to getting uh, a device on market? Are you pleased with, with the track record so far? Well, I'm not pleased with the time, and that's why we're taking actions to try to make this program more predictable, consistent, and transparent. It will require several things to get there. There are changes FDA has to make. There are things we need from industry. We need to get the quality submissions to us, and we want to work with industry on that. We need to have adequate and stable resources to do it. I will tell you, as comparison to the drug program, and I'm not suggesting the same by way of funding, but um, the user fees collected in drugs are 10 times the amount as for the device program. Okay, times and, the and also the, the, the revenue 
gain from that in, in the marketplace is, is significantly greater than, than that. But let me ask you a general, another question. Is, is the length of time from submission, well, from first communication to getting a device on the market, is that longer or shorter than it was five years ago? Uh, the length of time for the total, our review times have gotten generally shorter. They have? Uh, uh, they have overall for, for the different goals. The total time, our time, industry time, has lengthened for 510Ks. It's over the past few years remained roughly the same on PMAs. Interesting. Okay. Is it getting less costly or more costly? Um, I don't know. Why don't you know? Because uh, we don't do cost analyses for what the manufacturers are doing. Okay. So there is no cost estimate. The government would have no cost estimate of the regulatory hurdles that they are putting in place for industry. Um, no, I would not know of the total cost to a particular company, no. Okay. That, that in itself, Mr. Chairman, I think is a, is a problem when a government agency doesn't realize the impact they are having, because it is my constituents that are going to be paying this, this, uh, you know, this cost. It is passed along to consumers once we get the devices on the market. Uh, look, I empathize, uh, I empathize with you. Uh, I do. But uh, my concern is with the data that we have seen is that it takes longer now than it did just a few years ago to get a device on the market. And that is a big concern. And that is a big regulatory concern that uh, I appreciate the fact that you are looking at that and trying to reduce that time. But I would encourage you to look at the cost as well that uh, industry is going to have to bear in order to comply with these regulations. Thank you. I thank the gentleman from North Carolina. The Chair would now recognize the gentleman from Arizona, Dr. Gozar. Dr. Shuren, um, I am a dentist, and, and um, I am very principled about process. Um, so um, I am sure you are aware of the FDA's Regulatory Procedures Manual that just came out in March 2010? Um, I know of the manual, yes. Okay. So, I mean, I am coming back down to basics. Is there, is there anywhere in the Regulatory Procedures Manual that a case study on how medical devices should be approved, whether they are Class I, Class II, Class III? Um, to my knowledge, I am not aware of that. See, once again, these are fundamental problems, because what we have to do is we have to have everybody on the same line of expertise, what it takes for a one, two, and three. Um, so I take it that the staff is not trained in those procedure aspects. No, in terms of how to treat the different devices, they are. But if you want to put out what, the, what you need to do for a particular device, there will be some differences depending upon the type of device. And this is why industry says to us, can you please put out more guidance on the specific types of devices to clarify what the expectations are? And we agree there should be more guidance that is put out. So you have a framework for these 501K reviewers? Uh, we do have a framework for the 510K reviewers. And we are also right now doing a guidance in terms of clarifying that standard, because there has been confusion on some of our reviewers. We found that on our own analysis. And we have had confusion on the part of industry. And the best way to deal with that is to clarify that through guidance and then to have training on it. So how would, what kind of impact would that have on the endpoints that are, seem to randomly move with the, the, the reviewers? Well, I think in terms of clarifying what the standards are and what needs to be done, you'll have far more consistency in both what we do and I think also what industry does. Is there, is there a way or do you provide uh, interaction, um, you know, like a, a how-to seminars where you actually have reviewers and manufacturers coming together and looking at this process? See, one of the things I'm seeing over and over again, I sit on natural resources as well as this government oversight, is this huge a proliferation of, of agencies um, uh, pending um, uh, uh, different checkpoints and time delays, because time is money. Okay? And, and I heard you say something earlier about the pharmaceutical aspect, and you don't want to get me started there, because out in rural Arizona, we got problems. We can't even get medications properly uh, for surgeries. We are actually rescheduling surgeries. So once again, we are not doing something good on the drug manufacturing as well. But um, when we are taking these delays, and there is a, you know, venture capital is at a minimum here, and we have to have a return on investment. That is what the business model is talking about, and that is what my good friend over here was talking about and alluding to, is that we are forcing people to go to Europe because we are becoming so antiquated. We are not trying to work with people. We are trying to stymie the process. Because what I see here is 
if you take statistics, you can juggle them any way you want to. It seems to me when the science is easy, you bring them here. When the science is hard, you go to Europe. So something is wrong there. And I agree. We are not comparing apples to apples, Europe to the United States. But we are forcing people to go to Europe because of the finances, because of the process. It is all of this. Does that make sense to you? I understand the concern. I think to the extent that FDA, any unpredictability or inconsistency in our process that may contribute to companies making business decisions is something that we are trying to address. Um, there is also the impact of the global recession. I will take responsibility for changes in weather patterns, but maybe not for the global recession. And that has also impacted the dollars that are available for investment and the decisions that are made. And that, that aspect of it is not in my control. But to the extent we can make the program more predictable and consistent, that is what we are trying to do with the actions that I laid out previously. So wouldn't it be, I mean, no one wants a recall. So wouldn't it be behoove us to work with the industry, to sit down jointly in, in a venture to say, listen, there is limited capital. We definitely want to have the innovative spirit. We want to definitely keep that here. Um, how do we streamline this? How do we work this? And it starts with basic building blocks. And it ha comes back to the basic building blocks of what business is about. And that is one thing I am seeing constantly over and over again in government is a lack of business skills and understanding what it takes to actually get something to the market. Actually, we have been going out to industry for a long time. This assessment that we talked about where we said identify the root causes. Let's not do superficial surveys. Let's do the deep dive. We went out, we had significant engagement with the public. We had public meetings, two of them, three town hall meetings. I traveled around to different parts of the country, both in open meetings and in closed door meetings with different groups. We had um, three public dockets available for comments. And based, we got comments on the assessment, we made recommendations, we got comments on those. And based upon all of that input over a period of time and analyses is when we then put out the different actions we'll take. And that is more guidance. That is more training for our folks. That is different changes in the procedures and the processes within the center. Well, then it seems like you are gathering the information, but that it is an implementation. So let me give you an example. Uh, in July 2010, the Advancing Patient Safety Coalition, which is made up of patients facing groups such as the American Hospital Associ Association, the American Nurses Association, wrote a letter to the FDA Commissioner Hamburg asking for a, a firm timetable for the FDA to establish a unique device identifier system. It is widely understood that a system of UDIs for medical devices would improve patient safety, prove clarification for medical device users, and make the recall process more efficient. Yet, over nine months after this letter and four years after the passage of the FDA Amendment Act, we have no UDI uniform rule. When will you be putting the regulations for this unique device out, and why is it taking so long? Um, this year, the rule is in administration clearance. It will be out this year. Uh, well, and, uh, can you be a little bit more specific? Because I mean, it just it, it, there's not these timetables. There, there is no fixation about timetables. It, it, they just continue to, to, to be pushed and pushed and pushed. Um, for right now, it is in a process that is outside of my control, so I can't give you the exact date when it will come out, but it has been a high priority for us. Thank you. I thank the gentleman from Arizona. Uh, Dr. Sheridan, I want to uh, start by uh, uh, commending you for doing something that I haven't seen in the brief time I have been here, which is acknowledge that there may be problems with the agency that you sit there representing. Um, it may not be unique, uh, but it is certainly unusual to have someone do that. So uh, with respect to that, I think, uh, and I, I hope I am using your words, uh, unpredictable, inconsistent, and opaque. Um, the opaque may not be your word. It may. I have certainly heard you use the word unpredictable and inconsistent. Uh, I think in your written testimony, you just simply acknowledge the FDA recognizes it can do a better job. Uh, my question to you, or let me first ask you this first. You solicited input from industry on how FDA can improve itself, correct? And that's correct. And how many recommendations would you say that you got back that had merit? Um, I, we'd have to go back and check. I will say we we got a limited number of recommendations from different groups. 
Um, most of it was feedback to the recommendations that we put out. All right. It, it, again, I stand to be corrected. Um, it, it strikes me that of the recommendations you received or the recommendations that you seek to implement, you are going to use a, a quote, case-by-case -case analysis. Now, I will ask you to put on your other hat, your JD hat. There is nothing in the world less predictable than a case-by-case -case analysis. Um, it frustrates law enforcement. I suspect it frustrates industry. Um, what bright line, uh, reformative measures came out of that survey? In other words, if we are pleased to host you a year from now, um, what statistically measurable progress can we expect as a result of your asking for input in your own reforms? First off, we are not using a case-by-case -case analysis as we go through for doing pre-market reviews. Um, in those cases, we are actually looking to have more guidance on the expectations across a particular kind of device. We have many of them out now. Uh, we think there should be more of them. Uh, we will be able to get a few more out with some changes in efficiencies that we are putting in place, like a core staff to oversee the process and a tracking system and standard operating procedures. But a big increase in guidance documents um, isn't going to occur with the current resources, because right now I have review staff who are getting pulled between trying to write a guidance document and reviewing applications. We need to have a core staff of technical writers, and we need to have enough of our own expert staff where we can spend the time to do the guidance and not have to pull people away from pre-market review to slow up any of those times. Now, in terms of measurable progress from a year out, um, um, a year out, most of the things we will probably see will be on the qualitative side. Um, I think, though, coming out from a year afterwards, what we are hoping to see is some of the times in terms of overall times might start to come down. Um, we will see, actually, if we go back and talk to people, you will hear less concerns about um, asking for data if data was inappropriate or asking for data with better for clarification for why. Um, qualitatively, I think greater success with our interactive review with manufacturers in terms of the engagements that we have. Some of the things to make this work, we need to be able to get out the policies and procedures for everyone to get on the same page if we are going to get maximum value out of this system. So I think in the coming year, we will see things start to turn around. We are going to see um, firmer implementation as we get a little bit beyond that and those policies are finalized. So you asked about challenges in doing things. Um, when we put out guidance, we open that up for public comment. That is a good thing. We should get public comment. It also takes time. I got asked about the unique device identification rule coming out. That is rulemaking. I have to do an economic analysis. It is required by law. It lays in time. People like that but it, it adds time to it. So there are things we are doing at some of it because of the process imposed by us by law will take a little bit longer. The internal changes will take less time. I will give you one last example. We have set up what we call a Center Science Council. It is our most senior uh, leadership and experienced staff to oversee our science programs. This includes pre-market review. One of the issues that now comes to the Center Science Council is if the review team feels that they want to change what is going to be asked for across a type of device. That is being brought up to senior management for input before a decision is made on it. Um, so we get the weigh-in from senior leadership and more experienced staff. We have already had a, come, a case come up as a result, and that wound up changing the dialogue about what we are doing. Those kinds of changes are already going into place, and we are starting to see a difference. I think that will have ripple effects over the coming months. Well, Dr. Sheridan, I'm sure that you can appreciate uh, the concern that, that you've heard today from my colleagues, and 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 your your challenge is is a, a large one, balancing innovation and safety. I I don't minimize that that is, that is a challenge. Uh, my colleagues' uh, challenge is to create uh, an economic environment uh, that is uh, conducive with entrepreneurship and. Uh, to create a regulatory and, in some instances, a litigation scheme that doesn't bleed jobs uh, to other countries. So um, I look forward to having you back and hearing about the progress uh, that you made. And um, I um, 
would uh, yield a couple of seconds to my uh, colleague from, uh, from Tennessee because I promised uh, I would. Um, and I will, whatever time he consumes, I will give to my colleague from Illinois uh, to balance it out. Uh, Dr. Desjarlais. Dr. Sharon, I was just uh, you know, listening to the testimony as a whole, and, and uh, I think that uh, it would be fair to say that you believe that the FDA's oversight is superior to that of the Europeans. I believe that the U.S. standard for approval is the robust standard that we should stand behind. And I think that the FDA needs to do a better job in terms of how we run the programs for that standard um, to make the system work. We also need industry to provide us with the proper and high quality submissions and with clinical trials of high quality. That will go along the way. And ultimately, though, we need adequate and stable resources to run this program if we're doing it right. You heard from industry that one of the big issues for them is the high turnover rate of our reviewers. We are not going to solve that without the resources to do it. If we are going to put out guidance documents, more of them, that will require additional resources. If we are going to have the capacity we need to handle the growing workload, will be a resource issue. In fact, from 2007, my workload went up 26 percent. But under the use of fee program, the FDA assumes 100 percent of the risk of the increase in workload. None of that is built into the use of e program. None of it was considered or thought to have were going to happen when we renegotiated MEDUFA II. And that's had an impact on people. As a physician moving forward, uh, looking at our patients, which we both have great concern for, does it bother you at all uh, that the Affordable Health Care Act is based on the European model? The Affordable Health Care Act. Um, uh, for better, for worse, and I'm beginning to think maybe for better, uh, left the medical device center out of it. So hasn't, uh, isn't an issue for me to talk about. Um, thank you. I yield back. Thank the gentleman from Tennessee. I would recognize the gentleman from uh, Illinois. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You know, as we went through the discussion, I couldn't help but be reminded of my mother, who used to tell us that haste sometimes will make waste and that it makes more sense to take the time that you need to thoroughly review whatever it is that you are doing with the idea that the quality of it is just and perhaps even more important than how quickly you are able to process it or get it done. I am convinced, quite frankly, that the process used by our Food and Drug Administration is, in fact, superior to what we find taking place in other places. I have had the personal experience of, of, of having to wait until something was perfected in order to have the level of comfort that my physician wanted to have before we did the treatment, I would urge you not to lower any standards or not even to think of lowering any standards, but to continue with the intensive effort to make sure that the quality of the instruments quality of the devices that are going to be used on the American public is of the highest standard. And so I commend you for doing that. I commend the agency for doing it. And uh, if you would care to respond, please do so. Um, I couldn't agree more that the standard we have in place is the right standard and the one we should apply. And I am not saying that as a defender of the FDA. I'm I'm sending, saying that as a physician who has taken care of patients. I'm saying that as a person who has been a patient myself, and the same for my family members and friends. I never want to give to them a device um, that isn't effective and that we don't know isn't effective um, if we can have that data. Because as a result, I put them at unnecessary risk, and particularly when there are other alternatives out there for them. It is not good for our health care system, which does have its challenges. Why do we want to spend money on technologies that ultimately turn out 
not to work and the cost of care for people who wind up having worsened conditions because they got an ineffective treatment when they could have gotten an effective treatment. And that is what has happened in Europe with devices that have been found subsequently to be ineffective and yet patients got them and not benign treatments. We're talking about implantable devices. So at the end of the day, the U.S. system I think is the right system. We just need to get behind it and we need to make sure that it's as predictable and efficient as it should be. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, thank the gentleman from uh, Illinois, uh, Illinois uh, Dr. Sharon, we, uh, we thank you. I, as you can tell, this issue uh, transcends the typical partisanship that we see here. It is a very personal issue for all the members on both sides uh, who, uh, believe it or not, are um, real human beings, uh, have uh, children and parents and spouses. And uh, I, I wish you luck as you balance um, innovation, uh, safety, and time. Uh, and it, it, it's a challenge. Um, and uh, I, I do look forward to, to checking back in with you uh, in a reasonable period of time and see what progress uh, uh, you are making. And, um, and uh, we wish you the best uh, as you uh, seek to lead the agency. Well, thank you. And we are very happy to come by, talk to you or the other members or staff at any time at your convenience. Thank you. We will take a brief recess to set up for the next panel. And uh, if you have a second, uh, some of us might like to come down and thank you. Uh, we'll be briefly recessed.